Well, hi there, and welcome on this new podcast. So, I've had that idea in mind for quite a while now, and I finally found the format I've been looking for to launch this alpinography series, the biography of impactful mountaineers that are rather unknown to the general public. Without a pause, let's jump straight into the very first episode. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the Raymond Lambert saga. Raymond is a Swiss alpinist born in Geneva in 1914, that at barely 20 years of age was already considered as one of the best mountaineers of his generation. To summarize, when Raymond was in the area, one could expect a beautiful show and the opening of new mountain routes. Despite that, if the name of Raymond Lambert has been slightly forgotten nowadays, it's because, besides the fact that he was an amazing climber on both rocks and ice, besides being a mountaineer capable of resisting the worst mountain weather, Besides being stunningly humble, Raymond was also quite unlucky. Amongst all his adventures, two have particularly impacted his career. The first one was the crossing of the Devil's Needles during the winter of 1938. A journey as violent as it was called, where any other human being would have simply perished. The second one was his fight on the Everest in 1952. Now, wait a second. Isn't it in 1953 that the first man set foot on the highest summit of the world? Well, yes, precisely. But if it hadn't been for Raymond, that might have never happened. But before talking about these events, it is important to properly understand who we're talking about. What's important to know is that Raymond is not a nobody. As I mentioned it, he is an out-of-the-ordinary alpinist with a lot of natural climbing skills. In 1937, he manages to do with his climbing partner Marcel Gallet the first ascent of the Cayman Needle and the Crocodile Needle in the Chamonix region in the French Alps during winter despite everyone telling them it is impossible to do. That same year, being only 22 years old, he graduates as head of the class of the Valley Mountain Guide School. Yeah, so FYI, Valley is a region in Switzerland. It has nothing to do with the parking valley. But if he manages to do quite a few first ascents in summer as well as in winter, Raymond also runs into a bit of unfortunate events. As an example, in 1935, he tries to become the first person to climb the north face of Les Drues, still in the Chamonix Valley, then considered to be the hardest climb ever. The north face of Les Drues is pure rock climbing on a 2800 feet long wall, with the summit being 12,300 feet above sea level. In other words, it's better not to be afraid of heights. Unfortunately, his climbing partners end up not being up for the task and he's forced to turn around despite being rather close to the summit. Three days later only, it is a French climber, Pierre Alain, so try to remember that name for future episodes, that successfully makes the first ascent. Following that failure, he tries to do, a few months later, yet again a first ascent on a strongly renowned mountain, the north face of the Grand Jorras. So, for those that don't know it, there are three legendary north faces in the Alps. The Eiger, the Matterhorn, and the Grand Jorasse. They are legendary because, besides being hard by default, in order to climb them, one must be able to master both rock and ice climbing, and since the wall is always in the shade, well, that's what north faces are all about in the northern hemisphere, one must expect to fight freezing temperatures even during summer. This time, however, Raymond lives with a female climbing friend called Lulu Bula. So yeah, what's important to understand is that Raymond is a great guy. We are in the 1930s, and a woman that climbs, while it still made a lot of people raise eyebrows just a few years ago, well back then let's just say that it made everybody laugh. Well not Raymond. He couldn't care less. In his mind, it's very simple. If you can climb, you climb with him regardless of your sex, period. Hashtag screw prejudices. They both start the ascent that is now considered to be a classic climb in the valley with the worst weather possible, having to climb wet rock under a tropical rainfall before finally reaching the summit covered by a large amount of snow. Unfortunately for them, if they both think they just cleared the very first ascent, in reality, they'll learn that that route had actually been conquered by a German group less than 24 hours before them. It is only during their descent, so proud of their achievement, that they will be told about it. Well, yeah, there was an Instagram back then, news to time to travel. There you go, 
Before telling you about the two biggest adventure of his career, it was important for me to really establish who Raymond was. A terrific happiness, brave, sturdy, yet a tad unlucky. Let's talk then about the harrowing events of 1938, with the very first crossing of the Devil's Needles in the Chamonix area during winter. So if the name Devil's Needles still doesn't frighten you, know that it represents a series of five dizzying peaks that are all located above 13,000 feet and end up reaching the Tacu Mont Blanc. The Tacu Mont Blanc to better situated is located right under the Mont Blanc period. FYI, the Mont Blanc is the highest Western European summit. Needless to say that it is quite a challenge. Still today, and even more so back then, well, yeah, it's important not to forget. Back then, mountaineers only had a Hessian jacket and a wool sweater to protect themselves from the wind and the cold, a rope made from hemp to secure themselves, and a pair of flat sneakers to rock climb. In other words, not a lot. On top of that, the ascent here is done in winter by minus 30 degrees Celsius, aka minus 22 Fahrenheit. On a foggy morning of February 1938, Raymond and his rock partner Marcel Gallet, also a guide, leave Geneva towards Chamonix for what should have been four days only of adventure. One day for approach, two days of crossing, and one day to descent. With them, Erika Stagny, a client barely younger than our two climbers. Well, yeah, since they both just turned into professional guides, they can now go with clients. It's great! Not only are they going to perform a first ascent, but they also get paid to do so. If everything goes well at first and they manage to have a fast progression, they unfortunately get caught up in bad weather coming from nowhere. Again, we are in 1938, needless to say that weather forecasting is almost non-existent. The weather deteriorates quite quickly and ends up so bad that they can't even turn around. They are left with no other choice but to keep on with the crossing. It's a true blitzer that hits our three companions who, because of the slower pace forced by the storm, are forced to bivouac two nights under this downpour of wind and snow. Completely frozen, they'll still manage to successfully reach the summit, all while having lost all of their food supply and their sleeping bag after a bad fall. The weather doesn't give them any break. And without any visibility to locate where they are, surrounded by a desert of snow, they cannot find the way to go back down in the valley. As they are all but on the verge of dying from the cold, captured by the freezing blitzer that just won't stop, they find shelter in a life-saving crevasse. Protected from the wind, they'll spend three nights there, dehydrated, starving, frozen, at 13,000 feet with minus 30 Celsius. And that until Raymond decides to sacrifice himself and leaves the shelter to go get help. Well, yeah, back then mountain rescue did not exist. Nobody wanted to take the risk of dying in order to save someone else's life, especially in winter and during a snowstorm. Erica's mom, a very wealthy woman, seeing that her daughter was not coming back, managed to motivate local guides and some of Raymond's friends with a huge reward if they could bring back her daughter alive. With what needs to be called purely incredible luck, Raymond ended up being found crawling half-dead on a glacier and he managed, before falling into coma, to give the crevasses location so the other two could be saved. Subsequent to this adventure, Raymond was amputated of all his toes because of frostbite, as well as three phalanges on his right hand and one on his left. One might think this would demotivate him, but in reality, not at all. Raymond is a tough guy. After his recovery period, he gets special shoes created for his new feet size and heads back up towards the mountains. For your information, Erika didn't suffer any physical trauma thanks to Marcel Gallet's unconditional devotion. To make sure she wouldn't get any frostbite, he spent the entire time massaging the extremities of her body to make sure the blood would keep flowing. All that at the cost of his own health. Marcel had to be amputated of all his toes as well as his left heel, and since walking without a heel is impossible, he never went back to climbing. Despite his sacrifice, he couldn't even rely on Erika's mom's generosity, who refused to help him pay his medical bills. And Erika herself, who, while in the crevasse, had promised Marcel a ton of money if he got her out alive, did not hold on to her word. Unable to work, riddled with debts from treatment, Marcel never managed to recover either mentally 
nor financially. Oh yeah, and to make it even better, he was left for dead by the rescue team coming only for Erika. If some of Raymond's friends hadn't formed a second rescue team to go get him, Marcel would still be in his crevasse. There, I warned you, that 1938 ascent was rough. But what we can retain from it is the fact that Raymond is hard to bring down. Despite his handicap, he is going to keep on with his mountain guiding and ski instructor activities and in 1951 he will even earn a spot on the Swiss team to climb the Everest. And it is important to note that at that moment, no one had ever managed to set foot on that summit. For that story, there are quite a lot of information to share and I'm going to try to clarify everything so you can clearly understand what's happening. So first of all, you should know that since 1921, only British expeditions were allowed to try to climb the Everest, also known under the local name of Chomolungma. What happened is that all tries had to be done from the north, from the Tibet side, because the country of Nepal had its borders closed. But the British were the only intermediary back then between China and Tibet, and thus benefited from quite a few privileges. In 1951, China takes over Tibet and closes the border to everyone, but Nepal opens its own at the very same time. There is one condition, however. Only one team per year will get a visa to try to climb the Everest. And for the first draw, it is a Swiss team that earns that right. There you go. When the Swiss team reaches the foot of the Everest, it is the first time in 31 years that a non-British team can try to make the ascent. Imagine the weight of the nation the Swiss climbers had to carry on their shoulders and the unbearable stress from the Brits who stumbled like madmen for decades on this summit. FYI, the Swiss team is actually made only of climbers originally from Geneva, including René Diter, who was part of the rescuing team of 1938. The Swiss, well, they're really kind people. So rather than coming as colonialists and treating all the Sherpas like simple porters, the Swiss consider them like real members of the team. As a result, great connections are made. So for those that don't know it, Sherpas are a local ethnic group from the Himalayas. They know the mountains and they're used to high altitudes. Amongst them, there's one called Tenzing Norgay. And while he's the chief of staff of all other Sherpas, the Swiss consider him as a true guide because he already participated in many expeditions with the Brits in the past. Despite being unable to communicate between themselves in a common language, Raymond, who speaks French, and Tenzing, who speaks English, develop a great friendship. And Tenzing can't believe a man with such small feet can climb that well. When they reach the foot of the Everest, the Swiss, with their mountain experience and know-how, immediately visualize the route they should follow to reach the summit. As a matter of fact, it is still, today, considered to be the normal route. Without too much difficulties, they hike through the crevasses and seracs and set up a few high-altitude camps. After a few weeks in these makeshift camps so they could adapt to the high altitude, as a sunny spell shows up, Raymond and Tenzing decide to set forth towards the summit on May the 27th. Their rhythm is extremely slow, and they have to bivouac at 27,600 feet under a tent but without any sleeping bags. The next morning, way before the first ray of light, they set off again. And first starts the tragedy. At a record high 28,215 feet, Raymond and Tenzing are forced to turn around. At that altitude, the air is so rare that they can't take one step without using oxygen bottles. And even like that, it's hard to walk faster than a turtle. To better visualize, Above 24,600 feet, there's so few oxygen in the air that living cells are not able to regenerate themselves and the human body slowly starts to decompose. We call that a death zone. Unfortunately for our two companions, the oxygen bottles that they're carrying are not just heavy, they are also defective and thus unusable. They are less than 820 feet away from the summit. Do you realize the mental strength one must have to turn around so close to the summit? They've been there for two months, slowly hiking through this haze of ice to reach their current point. Before that, there's been months of preparation and logistics. An incredible amount of money has been spent. 
The entire world is following their progress thanks to radios and newspapers. Yet, right there, at 820 feet, a distance that when flat Yushin Bolt can cover in less than 20 seconds, they must turn around because of a freezing joint on their oxygen tanks making the bottle unusable. But Raymond is a clear-headed guy. He knows they can't keep going on and probably reach the summit, but seeing how slow they're going and thanks to his experience, he also knows that the cold and the lack of oxygen will take away their lives. And he has no intention of sacrificing his life or Tenzing's. Following their retreat, the weather will deteriorate and they won't even get a chance to try again. Back then, their achievement reached the front page of all major newspapers. The British on their end can breathe. After 31 years of struggle and research, the Swiss, with their vision, have found the route to follow to reach the summit. If it wasn't for a simple defective oxygen joint, Raymond would have been the first man on top of the Chomolungma. The Brits, who earned a visa for 1953, now simply need to follow the steps left by the Swiss with functioning oxygen bottles. Raymond, I said it, he is a good guy. He doesn't hesitate to share all his information he has with the British. Back in Switzerland, he even sends a letter to his friend Tenzing Norgay to ask him to climb with the 1953 British expedition because he knows they will need all of his knowledge to reach the summit. Well, Tenzing originally did not want it to. He only wanted to climb with his friend, his pal, his rope partner that saw him as a true climber, Raymond. So to honor him, when he became with Edmund Hillary the first man on top of the Everest, it's with Raymond's scarf around the neck that he did it. And that, well, there's not a lot of people that know about it. There you go. So to finish with the Raymond saga, I'm just going to share one more story with you. In 1954, Raymond aims to reach the summit of the Cho Oyu, still in the Himalayas and sixth tallest summit in the world, in order to realize the very first ascent with his female rope companion, Claude Cogan. Again, remember that name for a future episode. But at the bottom of the mountain, they come across an Austrian expedition that just failed their first try. Rather than benefit from the good weather and steal the victory, Raymond decides to leave the Austrian with enough time to recover and try a second time. He'll say something like, on the mountains, there's some sort of a law that states that competition in its commercial meaning is voided. There's a precedent principle. The second try from the Austrian will see the summit be reached. And unfortunately for Raymond and Claude, when they'll finally allow themselves to go up, the weather will deteriorate and force them to turn around. It might seem sad like that, but it's really to highlight how much heart and compassion Raymond carries with him. Later in his life, Raymond became an incredible airplane pilot that could land on the most difficult glaciers. He kept a close contact with Tenzing Norgay and became a source of inspiration for an entire generation of mountaineers. He passed away in 1997. There you go. In my mind, it was important that my very first alpinography be about Raymond Lambert, a tremendous mountaineer, brave, with strong resilience, and incredibly humble nonetheless. And it's a bit sad that his name might be slightly forgotten today. If you want to learn more about that man, well, you'll have to learn French at first, since none of his books or books about him have been translated, but just in case, here are some of them. Avant première à l'Everest, from Raymond Lambert, Gabriel Chevalet and René Diter. Record à l'Himalaya, from Raymond Lambert and Claude Cogan. À l'assaut des 4000, from Raymond Lambert. And Une tragique aventure au Mont Blanc, from Marcel Gallet. There you go. Thanks a lot for listening, and I will see you really soon for a new episode. See ya!